Um, and then we'll have some fun. But good luck, guys. Thank yeah. you. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, this is the uh, third live podcast webinar. So really um, excited for this one. Um, joined by some great panelists. And it's the first time it's going to, it's an all Manchester panel, <laughs> which is interesting. Um, <laughs> before, before we um, just crack on and we'll do introductions and stuff, um, I just very quickly, I just, I just jotted down some names on people I just want to give a bit of a shout out to because they've, they've been on every single podcast webinar so far. So I, I, I just really appreciate the support. So just wanted to give a very, very quick shout out to Mike Richards, Nathan Adams, Lily Shippen, Hannah Foley, Lauren Langstaff Roberts, and Robert Hanna. So thank you for your support. Really appreciate it. Um, let's have some fun. So Louise, mm -hmm. if you could go first, Hi. great if you could intro yourself for everyone uh, watching and tuning in. And then, yeah, uh, hi everyone. Yeah. Uh, my name is Louise Davy, and I am the MD of White Label Recruitment. Um, we're based in Manchester. Uh, at the moment, we've got 19 staff and we cover the engineering market on a permanent contract basis. Amazing. Thank you, Louise. John? Uh, yeah, I'm John Gohan. I'm the CEO of Finley James. We're a global tech sales recruitment company. Uh, we've got circa 47, 48 people uh, and they're based in Manchester, head office, London, San Francisco and New York. Amazing. Thank you, John. Last but not least. Yeah, my name's Sean McCleary. I'm MD of Insight Recruitment. Uh, we're IT and engineering recruitment based in Manchester. Um, we've got 40 people currently. Um, yeah. Cool. Thank you, Sean. So just a bit of housekeeping, um, everyone that is tuning in. So you should be able to see to the right or left of us um, a Q&A section. So... I'm just going to type in here to so ask your <coughs> questions here. So you should all be able to see the, the question that I sent. Um, and at any time, you can submit your questions. A big part of today is very much going to be um, you guys asking questions and making sure the, the panel answer them. So what you'll also be able to do is if you see someone submit a question that you really like, you'll be able to click upvote. Um, and that will just mean that that's a question that you'd really like them to answer. So at any point... You want to ask Sean, John, Louise a question, make sure you uh, type it in there and I'll make sure it gets answered. Um, so, look, guys, I've got a couple of questions before we start getting some questions from the audience. Um, but look, I've got, I've got to start with this one. It was sent in from Michael from SW6. And the first question I've got is, are Northerners better than Southerners? Yeah. Sorry. What do you think, Hashem? Um, well, my mum's from Oldham, so I'm a bit... I'm a bit um, but no, when I saw that come through, I had to ask that. Um, but look, what, what I'd love to, to sort of... Where I'd like to start is, look, a lot of you guys have been in the recruitment industry for, for a while and definitely around when um, the, the adversity that a lot of people had to go through in the past. So the sort of first question I have is, what what have you guys learned from previous times of adversity, challenges that you had to overcome that you think holds true in today's current landscape and, and the current challenges that we're all facing? What comes up for you guys when I ask that? Okay, I'll oh, happily God. go first. Uh, so my thoughts are, I think going back to 2008, 2009, uh, we went went through that last recession. We we were we we're a much smaller company. We were a twenty person company, uh, but we quickly realised that kind of doing nothing and waiting for the market to change wasn't an option. Okay. So myself and and my business partner Mark at that time, you know, we quickly decided that we weren't going to take any money for a period of time. Wow. And, you know, we sat down with the team and we basically said, look, this is this is pretty horrific. You know, we went from we were quite small. We were turning over all perm. We went from doing 100 a month to 20 a month yeah. for, yeah. you know, two or three months. So it was uh, it was a big drop off. So we at that point uh, weren't taking any money. And we asked uh, the, the people within the team. Uh, to take uh, a pay cut, a pay reduction. Yeah. And any government uh, grants at this point? 
no, no, go government. <laughs> I'm not sure where the government <laughs> were. Um, <laughs> I, I think the government were hiding behind the bankers at this point. Uh, yeah. But yeah, there was no help. There was no assistance. It was everybody was, you know, on their own. And also, there was no help at all from, uh, you know, networking groups. You know, people like the TRN, people like the Hive. Yeah. Uh, yeah. To basically talk to people in the same boat to get advice. So I think what we learned and what we did was you know, act and act fast to make changes and stop living in the past. You know, you need to start living in the present and the future and make some tough decisions and some pretty important decisions. But at that time, we made one person redundant. Uh, one person uh, decided to leave the business. You know, they didn't want to take the pay cut, but everybody else stayed with us. <clears throat> Even now, our RMD now, James May, yeah. has been with yeah. me for, you know, over 12 years. He was one of those guys as an entry level recruiter who took part in that and came out the other side and he's progressed right through the company to be our managing director. So I think the advice is do, do something and do not something. Yeah. Don't, don't stick your head in the, the sand, hoping for it to, to be better tomorrow. Cool. cool. Anything else to add, Louise or Sean? No, I think that's, that's a really good point about not, not living in the past. Uh, there's been a couple of times where we've had a few, a few things happen at white label where, We've had to make some big changes, and if you keep looking backwards and saying that's what we that's what we do, that's what we usually do, yeah. you, you're not you're not going in the right direction. So I think as long as your team are on board with making some big changes for the short term, yeah, you should you should be okay. But if you've got people in the team saying I, I'm not willing to do that, and this isn't what my job is, this is what what I'm paid to do, and they're not willing to be flexible, I think you're going to have a problem. So. I think sort of laying that out quite early on mm, okay. is, um, is important if you think that's going to happen. Sean? Yeah, I'd agree with both points there. I think on John's point around uh, making decisions and making them fast, I think, I think that's key. You know, um, whatever it is that you, you know, you're going to decide to do, I think um, acting and giving people confidence that you are proactively doing something is important. I'd also say, you know, don't forget about the customer. More, okay. Most most importantly, some of the best relationships, if I think back to 2008 and, um, you know, would, would be made then with customers where you can still add value when, you know, every other recruiter is probably not calling them or not wanting to speak to them because, you know, they don't want to have that difficult conversation. So, you know, you don't necessarily need to call them about jobs, for example, but, you know, being yeah. there to say, look, we're all in this together. Where can we add value to you right now? Yeah. Um, I think we'll come back with engagement when the market does inevitably pick up. Okay. So on that then, making decisions, thinking about the present, um, communicating to your team, clients, etc. What? So right now in the present, what, what's been the, the most dif difficult decision that you guys have had to make so far? I think um, I can John, take, do you want me on. to take that one? Yeah, go on. Yeah, I'll start off. I think, I think look, um, pretty much every business, I would say, at the moment is, is looking at cash flow pipeline, looking at, okay, well, you know, have we, have we got the resources to be able to continue at the level that, that we want to continue at, which certainly from an insight point of view, we've done. Yeah. Um, and I think it's been difficult in the respect of, you, you know, you're trying to make decisions on people with different levels of experience, different markets, um, and you're trying to, you know, you're trying to put some kind of a formula to say, okay, well, how can I get this business through this difficult time, but measure that we're in a position to still be successful when the in inevitable upturn comes. Yeah. So, so, so we decided from an insight point of view to very, very much have a, a, a collective, we're all in it together, um, approach to it with everyone committing to take a cut in terms of hours um and and i think um you know i've got to say hats off to to everyone that's been involved from my staff that that family approach to it has meant has made that decision a, a lot easier than it could have been okay yeah cool. louise john most difficult decision you've had to make so far over the last couple of weeks uh, so for us, it would be discussing the furlough and putting that option in um, now, which started from today. Yeah, uh, it was quite hard because I think we've got all these networking groups that we're in that we're linked into, which is brilliant. But probably spent 
a long time speaking to different people and not actually making a decision. So that's yeah, been quite quite hard. And thinking about what's another, what's other companies doing? Is this the right choice? And yeah. not actually backing yourself and going, actually, this is what I think's right. And yeah. actually making that decision. I think I said that to you yesterday. Yeah. I feel so much better just making that making that decision. Um, but yeah, it was really really tough. Um, thinking, you know, how are the staff going to react to it? How are we going to how are we going to come out of this? But today, I actually feel like a big weight's been been lifted, and we can actually move forward with the business now and actually progress. Yeah. Um, because we've got a plan. So yeah. I think just not making a decision is <laughs> has, has been has been harder. Yeah, no, um, I totally get that. Yeah. I think- Obviously, it's back to John. John's point there, like back in 2008 or whatever, there wasn't loads of help that you could no. see, et cetera. But the sort of downfall of having a lot of help and support is that <laughs> you can always look and to get the answers from other people and yeah. prevent you from making your own decision. Um, John, what about you then? Obviously, I know we had an open conversation yesterday, but is it is it sort of in line with Louise on difficult decisions around furloughing and how to help the staff and what, what's been difficult for you? Yeah, I think uh, the furloughing is definitely right up there. And I think in some respects, that decision was made a little bit easier. So that we had started to kind of consider the furloughing conversation. And, you know, we, we were thinking about, you know, looking at a matrix, looking at a list, you know, who can contribute and perform under these conditions <laughs> and, and stay on the pitch and who are going to be better served, you know, on the bench, you know, ready to come back contributing yeah. down the line. Yeah. and. I think one of the things that's great from, you know, talking to people is that, you know, we were advised to, instead of going to people and saying, look, you're on the list, you're being furloughed. It was who within the business would be comfortable and happy to be furloughed uh, based on kind of our understanding and our appreciation of what the the world is going to look like. And we've done it from a protective perspective whereby we've said, look, you know, being in this market at this moment in time is a bit like walking into a, a burning building. Now, yeah. if, if you're gonna walk into a burning building and you've got the experience, the apparatus, uh, the know-how, the skill to navigate your way through over the next two months, that's brilliant, you know, be on the pitch. If you haven't, you can help us in another way and help our bottom line while the guys who are not furloughed are helping the top line. So. What I'd actually say is what was going to be a really, really hard decision, it all kind of opened up in front of us as as not being a difficult decision at all because it was people chose and it was down to them whether they wanted to remain on the pitch yeah. or go to furlough. So we haven't got anybody on furlough today out of 19 people, including Sarah, my wife and business partner, yeah. who weren't happy and comfortable making that call. Okay. Well, thank you for sharing that. So, look, I think a lot of questions got submitted by people around the, the furlough piece. Neil, Neil Clough has already asked one, and I think it's, it's a really interesting one. So let, let, let's go to that question. Um, what, what are you guys doing then to, to yeah, keep your staff motivated and m- sort of that constant contact with them? Because, yeah, the, the people that you have put on furlough, what, what are the sort of thought processes and how are you planning on keeping your staff motivated and engaged whilst on furlough? Uh, I can take you through what we're doing. So basically, Sarah, as kind of the, the, the head of the furloughs, you know, she's uh, already created... A, a new title? Yeah, that could run and run. Uh, <laughs> they, they've also, they've already sorted out a playlist, you know, uh, but... A furlough playlist? A, a furlough playlist. So we've wow. got some, uh, some interesting contenders already. So... Uh, yeah, we, we've got, you know, 19 people and the idea is that we're going to have, a, you know, Sarah's going to be running some sessions with them in terms of, you know, having to catch up on a weekly basis to check in, make sure everybody's okay. They've got a WhatsApp group to communicate on all yeah. non-work related stuff. Uh, I'm going to give everybody an update every week in terms of the, like, the temperature of the business, you know, how we've got on, how things have done. Uh, the good, the bad and the ugly. So people are still connected to the business and understand what's going on, even though they can't contribute and they can't be selling within the business. So the the idea is we want those 19 people, including Sarah, to be, uh, you know, on the subs bench, but keeping fit and 
you know, being warmed up, ready to be called on when yeah. we come yeah. out the other side of this. And we may well find that people who are cracking on and, and you know, selling today and, and placing people today, they may well need a breather in a month or two's time. And yeah. we need people yeah. ready to perform. So uh, I think having two distinct groups, but we're still part of the, the FJ family, we're just helping the business in two different ways, you know, one on the top line, one on the bottom line, but it's all about communication. Uh, a number of the guys are going to be uh, joining the NHS for the, the foreseeable. Yeah, yeah so Sarah's well, yeah. one of the guys doing that. Natalie is another. So a bunch of them will be, you know, helping the community and helping, you know, parents, elderly parents, grandparents, and uh, still contributing to society in a slightly yeah. different way. Amazing, yeah. So you're, yeah. So you're really doubling down on the communication with with the people that you have furloughed. One week, yeah, weekly group video call, a WhatsApp yeah. group. Sarah's dedicated to communicating to these guys. Okay, cool. Louise, Sean, what what are you making sure you do to the people that you follow to make sure that yeah you're keeping them engaged and what are the plans on communication? Anything different to that or? It's all really similar. And um, the only other thing I'd, I'd add to that is we're just still waiting on um, the the clarification around training okay um, so it's a little bit of a gray area at the moment so obviously once we we, just, we work out that we'll be able to put full training uh, schedules together for the team as well and just go back to basics yeah with um you know you've got the delivery guys the sales guys um just to keep them motivated and learning yeah and um, give them a few ideas on you know just make sure that they're upskilled using video yeah on, on, i'm just going to sort of put them together something so they can think, well, when I was in recruitment and I was in my office, all those things that I never had the time to do, what can I go and do now to, to make myself better? Yeah. Um, they've probably got a list as, as long as there are of things that they wanted to do that they don't get yeah. a chance. So my advice to anyone that is on furlough would just be get that sorted out and get your house in order, really, so you come back to work and you don't have those issues. Yeah, nice. Um, it could even just be basic things like, you know, getting all your, your message templates organised research your clients properly you know yeah. actually you know put a client list together of actually go on websites and understand what they do and you know really get to grips with everything yeah um, so yeah a couple of people just obviously put a question in there or obviously just message very kindly louise you'll check it but yeah but look, a couple of claire saying yes you can train mark bracken uh, saying hmrc confirmed today you can train but i think i think that is the thing that a lot of conversations i've had is that with the fact that you can't even go into the portal right now, apply for the grant or whatever, like you want yeah. to make sure you do this by the book, that, like you don't yeah. want to be dabbling in any grey area because if it then means that you're not eligible for the grant or whatever, you're going to... Yeah, exactly. So, um, okay, that's... An, yeah, I think I said to my um, girlfriend who was furloughed from today, what what's on your what's on the list when you when you always used to say, oh, I wish I had more time to yeah. do this? It's a good question to ask yourself and what, what appears on that list and start tackling those things on that yeah. list. Um, yeah. Sean, anything to add, mate? Like anything that you sort of come up, come up with? No, look, I think I think connection and self development are key, really. You yeah. know, um, as as Louise and John have both alluded to, you know, it's still very much you know part of the business and making sure they feel like they're part of the business and can contribute in which you know whichever way to the culture of the business. Yeah. Um, I think from a communication point of view, for my people, it's very much led by them. There is some people nice. that feel that they want a bit more of a daily checking call or weekly checking call just to see what, to see how they're getting on. Whereas some people are very much more or less like, "I'll call you if I need, you know, if I need anything, if you know, if I need to talk to you about anything." So I think um, you know, letting them lead um, the communication and how they want to be kept involved as, as much as possible. Um, yeah. And then, and then I think on Louise's point, really, just encouraging them to set themselves up as as best as possible for success when the inevitable market upturn does come you know what what can they be doing in their in their own spare time to keep their skills up to date yeah um so that they they're positioning themselves in the best possible way cool um okay cool let let let's segue into um what you're hearing from your consultants or obviously what what you're experiencing yourself in terms of the actual market right now so is it fair to make the assumption that across the board with you guys and your teams may maybe very there there are some opportunities but the majority of stuff has been put on hold and it, yeah. yeah there's not much going on in your so louise you your your market is engineering engineering yeah so yeah. unfortunately a lot well 
most of them have, that we've called this week, all the key clients and companies we've placed with, um, are either not recruiting or start dates are on hold. Okay. Um, so it's it's not it's not really bad, but it's not great for this month in particular. Yeah, cool. yeah, um, and I think time. you know this particular time right now, as with as much will in the world, I think you know we've not even hit the peak of of the virus at the moment, and yeah. there's a lot to consider when you're calling around to these companies. You know, people are going to start being affected personally by. What's family going on? members contracting yeah. the virus and knowing people that know people that have got it. Yeah. So I think you need to be like morally, you need to sort of really think about how you do position yourself if you are canvassing and you are speaking to candidates because it could be quite upsetting for some people and not do your business any good. So Fair enough. there's gonna be there's gonna be a fine line and it's just probably managing that if you've got staff calling about still. Um, okay. Yeah. And then Sean and John then your markets like yeah there's a lot of it sort of dried up putting things on how is it quite similar yeah look i think it, it, it's changed it's changing daily i think is yeah you know it's fair to say if you asked me this question two weeks ago we were on for you know a record <laughs> performance uh, for, for, for for this month so um but i think it's changing daily i think you know why, why it's probably quite unique to other recessions i've been through before is you're balancing the uncertainty in the economy with the obvious, you know, logistics of not of everyone working from home and yeah. you know not being able to onboard new starters or interview new starters even if they wanted to. So, and and I think again, probably different from other um, recessions I've I've kind of been involved in is it's pretty much every sector yeah. across the world that's impacted, whereas it, it hadn't always been that way. So, yeah. I think there is still pockets of people recruiting. There is still opportunities. I think those. Particularly in tech, I would say those those um, companies who are already set up to, to for people to work remotely, yeah. um, maybe have a product that they want to deliver, have got funding already for that product, and have got a time scale that they they still need to hit. We're finding that those guys are still pushing on with recruitment and you know trying to use it as an opportunity to maybe hoover up talent that that you know other businesses can't at this moment. But um, I think the the general consensus is kind of caution around certainly the next few weeks okay so louise was just touching on it a bit there but i think look, this was really common from the last one james johnson's question what what is the approach right now to develop business which as we were just saying it is difficult and there's a lot of stuff that's going on the whole louise is talking about being empathetic being a human about it being understanding that the people you are calling could be impacted by this personally right so yeah. it, like yeah, what what do you think with this then, John and Sean? Like, how how can consultants right now approach business development, and how should they be approaching it? Do you think? What are you telling your guys? I think the conversations we've been having is, you know, we we've seen our job book drop from somewhere in the region of two hundred and fifty live vacancies to circa sixty wow. in two weeks. Yeah. Uh, now that. Could well be we we in some respects maybe had too many vacancies so yeah. uh, the upside there is you know we've got less and we've got enough people to concentrate fully on them to get them filled so our philosophy is let's fill the jobs we've got while okay. we've still got them yeah and let's be more efficient and more quality conscious than we've ever been and let you know if we're used to having maybe one person work on a vacancy why not double down and have two yeah. or why don't we have three and ensure that we've got the best chance possible of filling that that gig and our philosophy is you know let's kind of let's deal with what we've got while we've still got it yeah and in some respects wait for the market to return to to us so you know we're not looking at a hard sell we're not out there specking candidates into companies okay. yeah we're, we're, we're basically we're communicating with our clients and we're saying look if, if you are in a position to take on a tech sales or marketing person in april or may let, let's talk now yeah if you need some space and you need some time you yeah. know let's let's park it and let's talk to you when you are in that position so i think it's it's honing in and being more efficient with the stuff you've got yeah. Uh, yeah than trying to push you know push water uphill okay that's interesting so i guess so yeah like to tie this in stephanie levinson's question on what for anyone that isn't followed what are the next steps in terms of like what what should they be focusing on then so what you're saying is if you've got if your jobs have dramatically decreased 
focus on obviously the stuff that you do, do have, which makes sense. But then obviously that, for some people that the people I've spoken to that could literally, it could literally whittle down to one job yeah. or, or two clients. Right. So yeah. I guess, what you're talking about there, John, and these are some of the conversations I've had, so hopefully this helps, is that ultimately what's probably changed is the expectations of that BD call or the expectations of um, that um, sales call, as in instead of thinking about I want to try and get a job out of this call which would make it successful is um, c- let's have a conversation about what your plans are over the next couple of months or start to build a relationship, which is a, a slightly different expectation that it may have been to the call a couple of weeks ago when you said, did you pull that job or not? Do you get what I mean? Is yeah. That, yeah. That I, I can see where you're coming from. So I think the key thing is the, you know, the, the appetite to take, uh, you know, have you got any vacancies? Uh, that, you know, <laughs> that, that, that's not out there. Yeah. Uh, finding out where they're at and what they're doing and then yeah. thinking about what help you can give them. So for example, you know, we're looking to help our clients who are hiring with their onboarding strategy and get material through to them that they can use to help onboard the individual. Okay. Uh, you know, we're, we're helping them, you know, if they need any help and assistance in terms of, you know, what the market's going to look like in three to six months' time. If we find anything out in terms of what's going on in their space, we will look to communicate that with them that yeah. might have yeah. an impact on their buying decisions in months to come. So I think the key thing is uh, whatever a client wants to do, you can't, kind of blame them for doing it yeah and if, if if you know if a client you know cuts head count unfortunately even if a client were like reneges on an offer that's already been made which you know we've all had that that is the new life that we're living within so i think the key thing for me is even if you've only got one job then you should give yourself a very very good chance of filling that job yeah and most consultants depending on the markets don't place much more than one or two people a people a month yeah in certain sectors. so you know if you fill what you've got uh so if we if we've got 50 to 60 vacancies and we fill all of them over the next six yeah. eight weeks we'd be doing just fine so okay, yeah sure think think about quality and thinking about that added value and think about those five minute conversations you have with candidates that can now be half an hour so they're upskilled as as much as possible to go in and and get that job and yeah, instead so- of running around chasing your tail on five roles and doing a little bit on each of them pretty badly, do a fantastic, you know, awesome job on one role. Yeah, and that client will remember you out the other side of mm-hmm. this. Um, just one point I want to just highlight then, Sean, we spoke about this. So I'd love to get your thoughts on this. Um, so one of the questions that um, I got uh, that was submitted for this was um, from a lady called Charlotte um, Leitner. Apologies if I pronounce that wrong. But basically, she said, we are fortunate to recruit within digital. So some of our clients are still hiring, but are hesitant, unsure on how to onboard new starters remotely, right? And this is a really common headache that I've heard from a lot of people. So her question is, how are your clients managing this, if they if they are at all? And do you yeah. have any tips or advice that you can share? Because I think that's what you just touched on, John. But I know we spoke about this, Sean. What, what comes up for you on that with that? Yeah, I think, um, I think, look, firstly, it can all be done digitally. Um, and I think the more that you can lay out a process, I, I think, look, what it is, we're humans are creatures of habit, I think, ultimately. And, you know, if you've always onboarded someone in one way, um, then, you know, you naturally fall back to that way of onboarding. But I think it's an education piece with clients. If you can educate them, look, you can, what are your objectives with onboarding someone? And, and what I've found is it's moved it's moved away more from like the policies and procedures side of onboarding someone because that's almost come less important, I would argue, in this current climate to just focus on that. Yeah. And more about integrating people within the business, upskilling them and getting them as quickly as possible immersed into your culture and bought into what you're doing. So a lot of that side of onboarding can be done via video. You know, we're encouraging... We've got some of our clients who hiring managers are doing um, an introduction video for themselves to to kind of introduce okay. the person to the team. You know, there's, there's obviously team meetings that can be done over Zoom. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a lot of content or video or whatever that can be sent to people to learn. Um, so I think the, the, the people who are doing it best in my mind are 
they're not focusing so much on you know the policies and procedures and you know ha have they kind of read the staff handbook about x y and z but they're more thinking about right okay well how can we kind of upskill them as quickly as possible yeah. in the role that we need doing and can that be done virtually um and and then can how can we get them kind of immersed in our culture and mm. bought into what we are as a business as quickly as possible nice john anything to add to that that you've been speaking to your clients about no i, th I think what we've noticed is uh even the kind of the slowdown in the market we we've seen less of a slowdown in the the states than the uk okay and what i'm seeing is that certainly the guys in the states that they're, they're used to onboarding people uh remotely i think because the, the country is so so huge uh that's the only option on occasion so yeah uh, they they've just kind of cracked on and you know people have been offering people jobs last week and you know they started uh this week so uh i think the the, the key thing is you know we need to be thinking about what we're doing with our business now and i'm sure uh the, the guys are thinking the same that you know do we need that two-week induction in manchester and sending people up from London, and uh, or can we actually get a, you know some stuff in the can from a training perspective, and the intros, and the processes and the procedures? So I think most companies will be looking at this and thinking, right, during this slower time, what can we build now that can save us money in the the quarters to come from an onboarding perspective? So I think whether it's you know. Uh, you know, being able to onboard remotely or whether, you know, we can do meetings remotely and save money and time kind of moving around the place. You know, I think that's going to be a, a big question for, for everybody moving forward. Okay, interesting. So we're actually, to, we're, actually, um, we're actually taking somebody on uh, next week at White Label. For your so, business, okay. Yeah, so um, f for me, I feel like it's a good thing if, and we're going to communicate this to clients, what we're actually going to be doing. But nice. most of the time when you start a new job, you don't get given a lot of time. You get thrown in the deep end. You get expected yeah. to to do, you know, hundred work hundred miles an hour. Well, the way that I'm going to pitch going to say hundred calls on the first day. <laughs> and that as well, yeah. Um, yeah um, is speak to the clients about just taking it really slowly and just making sure that the candidate actually understands the business and. Yeah. In, in full because you'll you know every business is guilty of, of onboarding someone and then you know two weeks later they're like they've, they've always been here yeah so with the way we're going to do it is just set like bite-sized chunks for the new starter and then just keep yeah. feeding back to them and just keep checking in have they done this nice. and what did they get from it and they've got a real good chance to learn about your business properly and mm. um, you know reading your documents properly learning about your products or your services and so I just think it's it's a good thing in a way. It's just it's whether you can get that across to your clients or not. But I think you would need to have, you know, good half an hour, forty five minute conversations on a regular basis, yeah, um, to educate them on that. Okay, no, that, that's really interesting. So what what I just really love to um, expand on, and this is pretty much Rob's question, but the question that I'm just going to read word for word was from a chat called Darren Simmons, um, and it's it's sort of all linked with this. So his question is, has anyone had success diversifying their offering into broader consultancy, right? So we're talking about here, could you impact the onboarding process? Could that be something you monetize or just add value around? Rob's question around looking at different revenue streams right now, right? So Darren's question is, yeah, so i.e. benchmarking, competitive analysis, talent pooling, etc. So have, any, have you guys, any you guys thought about this or I don't know, thought about some of the different things that you could potentially monetize in this short to medium term that isn't you hire this person and you pay me a fee. Does any, have you looked at that? Yeah, one of the things that I was looking at prior to uh, this whole crisis, actually. So I was having conversations with a couple of guys in Manchester and Nick Guy over in New York about uh, I see the, the pricing of recruitment changing. So it's it's changed in everything else we do bar recruitment. Okay. So, you know, the way we pay for Netflix or the way we pay for Sky or the way we pay LinkedIn, you know, yeah. it's not yeah. on how much you use it and how much success you have. It's, you know, it's subscription based and kind of quarterly based. So I had talked to people about, you know, instead of charging clients on, you know, the win, you know, the higher, the, the bum on the seat, whether we should be looking to kind of uh, charge people on 
the, monthly the, basis. The of, well, ch charge them on a subscription basis. Yeah. Uh, on certain metrics that you know we charge so much a month, and what you get X. for that month is yeah. X, Y, or Z based on how much you pay. So I think what will come out of this in three to six months' time is I think we'll be forced into looking at the way we charge and the way we price and the yeah. way uh, people purchase kind of our services from us. So we, we've not really thought so much about, you know, the additional services while we've still got live vacancies that yeah, we want to fill. That makes sense. Uh, but if they run out, you know, it's kind of needs must, you know, what else can we offer that our clients will value and our clients will derive uh, benefits from. Okay. Sean, you have you thought about this or heard anyone in yeah, the live or anything like that? Yeah, I think obviously the challenge at the moment is, you know, a lot of businesses are in probably a price sensitive sure. mode. So it's kind of, you know, a bit of a difficult conversation to say, right, well, I'm <laughs> yeah. going to charge you for something else over and above actually finding people for you. But sure. but I think, you know, what, what, what we have been doing at Insight is evolving our offering and offering a lot more added value services, more based on commitment really than necessarily charging extra for them. And I think if you, you know, if you can hone those now, then then potentially down the line when there is more confidence and it is probably less price sensitive, I suppose, then then I think you would be able to for them. So some of the things we've been doing is working with clients on their EVP, you know, really as part of our okay. process to helping them get get people on board is looking at how they're branding themselves in the market what's their um what's their process for onboarding and tying that into right look we you know we can help you get part of uh, us attracting the best staff to you is making sure that in the market your your brand is represented yeah. in the right way so again i think that is a thing that can be could be charged for at a later date um okay. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, you touched on it, kind of competitor analysis, talent pooling, things like that. We've all done that more as a retained search yeah. process as part of that than necessarily a standalone product. But, you know, if someone's confident enough to sell that in the current climate then and can charge yeah. for it, then, then fair play to I them. Know. You know, see, give, get them to give me a call <laughs> if they want the job. Yeah. <laughs> fair enough. So, like, on this then, like, I, I've seen a lot of it and I've definitely thought about it. So I'm coming to um, Dylan's question, basically, talking about if an end client has lowered their fees due to the current crisis we're in, price sensitive that you're talking about, um, a lot of people I've seen online that offer their services for free and things like that. Like, what do we think about that? Should should you be offering your services for free right now? Like, I don't know. What, what do we think about that? Because I think a lot of people are thinking and, and, and doing that. So what do we think about that? I don't think you should be offering. No. You're, you, should, you, know, you shouldn't be offering your kind of core service of placing candidates or, or whatever the recruitment side of it for free, ultimately. Um, yeah. But I do think that more and more there is an opportunity to give value and give content and give information um, for free yeah. that will that will in return kind of win your business further down the line. So my personal point of view would be don't, offer your core services for free. Yeah. Um, if, if businesses are asking you to do that, um, then they probably don't value what you offer. But yeah. I do think that you can offer, you know, additional things around your core service as a, as a value add uh, on the understanding that you're building relationships with customers that hopefully are then going to pay you for the core services you offer. Mm. There will be clients that are going to use this to, to, to ask you for, for those those discounts as well. I think you yeah. have to look at it on a case by case basis. I think a discount's a little bit different to obviously free. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so a, a discount maybe, but if they was asking for free, I don't know how they'd expect you to run. So like say they're not they're not going to value you long term. Yeah. So maybe you'd look at your client base if if you're starting to get that. Yeah. Have you have you so like have any of you guys had conversations around just grown up conversations around? Look, we're both in a difficult situation right here. You you have an invoice that you need to pay, or this is what it costs. But we can look at spreading it or whatever. Do you know what I mean? I think that it seems like a lot of people are having those conversations, just being yeah, grown think, up about. Look, this, yeah. This I, think, far... I think for look again, everyone is in a similar situation that you know cash flow and. Um, and, and things like that are, are, are important. So, you know, if, if companies are genuinely in a situation where um, 
they need more time to pay or whatever, then those are things you could definitely look at. But I, I would always personally try and advise on, right, okay, well, how can you tie them into some, some longer-term commitment? So, you know, for example, if if someone is saying, right, well, I need a discount on a particularly if it's a placement that's already been done and already agreed, then, you know, tie it, tie it back to say, okay, well, you know, we'll, we'll credit this again, you know, we'll credit this against the future placement or, you know, let's, let's yeah. look at a piece of work over the next six months, yeah. um, which is going to cost X. And if we hit that piece of work, then we will discount you further. But I think, I think for me, it would, it would really be making sure you've got the commitment at the other end rather than just, um, people using this as an opportunity just to get out of paying or yeah. or, or or get yeah that makes sense. prices personally. yeah i think it is, it is a bit of a weird time it's, it does feel a bit weird to chase invoices and like we had this one the last one it's, it's someone asked yeah. about chasing debt right and it's can be difficult do, do you know we, I mean? we, had, we had a really good week last week chasing debt thankfully <laughs> <laughs> how, how would that be <laughs> You have to see Louise. Yeah, that she doesn't smile. Yeah, yeah. Like that anyway. um, <laughs> no, we we um, we just had a little bit of a, a chat about it and just made sure again that the conversations were being done in the right way and yeah. that the clients understood where we were coming from. A lot of it was contracts and um, contractor payments anyway, so okay. it's not too difficult when you can say, "Look, I've paid the contractor." Yeah, it's it's not that hard to to, to say and. Um, but you know there are there are ways around it, and you don't have to go in all guns blazing. And I think it's you know if you do it in the right way and the right person does it as well, it might be that you need to change um, who call, who makes the call. If you've not got someone, you might have a really good credit control, but maybe they're brilliant at getting money in, but that might not be the right person right now to do this. So maybe just switch yeah. it, even if you switch it to yourself, um, so you're in control of it. Yeah, no, that, that's right. interesting. Um, so the question I want to go to, Claire Mohammed's question, um, and it, it, this, this, this sort of come through a couple of times, because um, I think it's fair to say, the other question that I'm just looking at that I've got prepared on my phone is from Rory from B Recruitment, and it's, it's very much like if, if your market right now is just in the complete shutdown and you've got your niche, that, that's what you've been operating in over the last however long, um, like, should like if if you're in a place where right now everything is shut down and there, you can't see any opportunities, should you should you be diversifying right now, or should you stick to your guns and stay niche? What do we think about that? I think my, my thoughts on that are it, it depends. It depends on the niche you're in. Yeah. And what, you know, a niche that you're potentially considering, because what what you've got to look at is if you're jumping into somebody else's niche. Yeah. If the company's already in that niche, a furloughing staff because it's so tough, and they've got 10, 12, 15 years of experience doing it, yeah, it's, been tough. it's going to be tough. So, I, you know, I wouldn't dream of jumping into Sean's market and be trying to compete with him and his business yeah. doing what he does. And I think, you know, he might think the same jumping into yeah, tech yeah. sales and, you know, we, yeah. we compete with oh. Finley James. So I think in that situation, uh, I think control the controllables and that's where you do take advantage of the furlough and, and basically get your cost base down to as low as you can Yeah. because you could crack on and do more money in trying to attack a marketplace that you've got no experience of and no exposure to Yeah. and that could cut your runway in half as opposed to sticking with your niche you know, learning, development, getting all that good stuff done, buy, and buying yourself time, which is that that's what I see the furlough is. Yeah. Buy, buying some time for the business and extending your own yeah. way to stick with what you know. Yeah. Because, Fair you know, ed education recruiters jumping into engineering recruitment or vice versa. I, I, I think that's potentially the way to the, the poorhouse. So it's not a route I'd go down, but. Yeah, you know, yeah. That makes sense. We, 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 go on, Louise. Oh, that's, that's, we um we went into panic mode a little bit when it when it first all started off and we started um not going into different markets but ones that were, were sort of maybe next to next to us um yeah. so obviously in engineering we could start looking at like the pp companies textile companies it isn't what we do it, it's quite easy for us to do it but it, it wasn't what we do and i realized like after sort of 10 12 days of trying to do that there's going to be agencies that have already got it covered so why are we yeah. going to just what john just said why are we going to be any better at this 
Um, so I think the quicker you realise, just stick to what you know and learn more about what you know mm. is yeah, the way man. forward. If you can take the option to, to do the furlough as well and buy yourself a bit of time to, to really niche down even further, I would say, in the markets that you're already in. Yeah. Um, like I say, doubling up on, on markets when you have got a job on, putting a couple of people on it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's the point I was going to make. I think there is, you know, there's an opportunity for like a, a niche within a niche. So, yeah. you know, if you are, for example, in engineering, is there certain sectors of engineering that's still in your vertical, but are less affected? You know, I don't know, for example, the utilities industry, because you've, you've clearly got to keep, keep the lights on, for example, yeah. uh, you know, then then I think there is the opportunity to look at sectors that you that are maybe a little bit more resilient, mm -hmm. yeah. but, uh, you know, um, but still sticking within your niche. Um, okay. but, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't advise completely changing niche unless of course, you know, that niche was already, you, you know, was already challenging coming into this situation. Then, you know, suppose you could look at it and say, right, well, you know, particularly if I'm say furloughed, for example, is there an opportunity for me to, to take that two months to map out something new and re yeah. restart something new but yeah. if you're only doing it because of this particular situation and you're confident there will be an upturn then i would say ride it out and position yourself in in, in best possible place to take advantage when it does cool so talking about riding it out giving yourself more runway these types of things mark's question and i know that sean we we're talking about this before like you've got a review on a day-to-day -day basis and things change but I think people just think wanting to know what other people are thinking and how they're approaching it. Like, yeah, like Mark, Mark has said there, what, what length of time are you currently planning and forecasting over? Let, let's just share that with everyone. And how you well, we were talking that. about it earlier, so I don't, <laughs> mind, I don't mind kicking off. We, we, we're currently forecasting it on a, on a quarterly basis, so we've got a plan for the next three months. But, you know, I think um, the term John used was Cobra meetings twice a day, which I, <laughs> which I quite like to, you know, it is staying on top of it daily very much just because things are changing. I think the, the variable that um, is also difficult to forecast is, <clears throat> you know, we, we don't know how long we're going to be in a lockdown situation. So, um, you know, if, if we knew that, right, okay, definitely be out in two weeks' time, then I think you could probably predict when the upturn would be a little bit more confidently than, you know, at the, at the moment, we, we, you've got to forecast for that worst case scenario as well, really. Yeah. Okay. Is that the same for you guys, John and Louise? Yeah. Um, I said earlier on the calls to Sean and John, <laughs> I think I'm on plan 18 now. <laughs> um, the paper bin at work's full. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, I've spent so much time planning and yeah. Then the next day, I'd open my emails or you look on the news and then something different happens or you find out new guidelines from the government, which yeah. totally throws you sometimes in a good way or sometimes yeah. in a bad way. So I would say my advice would be to plan yeah. weekly, monthly, quarterly. I would personally be planning now till Christmas, okay. but then don't stress too much if you've got to change it on a daily basis because... We, Probably by nature, we're all planners and we want to, yeah. you know, see this outcome. But mm. don't let it stress you out if you have to change it. Yeah, that makes um, sense. Yeah, okay. I, I would be planning to, well, I am planning personally till Christmas. Okay. Yeah. So just a quick one on this, which I think is an interesting point and, and probably really valuable is sort of um, the things that you're look like. So having a visibility in your business, right? Especially with your team being remotely in terms of, um, I don't know, tools like Cube19 or whatever, right? So how important is it to have... So what you're saying is you're planning, but what are the what are the things are you making sure that you're checking on a weekly basis or looking at the things you have visibility on that um, are sort of key things that you're keeping a look on to that's going to help form the decisions that you make? Do you know what I mean? Is it just money in the business or revenue? Like what what are the things that you keeping a close eye on out of interest in terms of data points or anything like that? I, I think for me, it's what one is uh, sticking close to. You know our, our financial manager and, and basically how are things looking uh, for the month ahead and you know three months and six months so you know we, we've got a plan for the next three months and then for months four to six as well but uh, I'm looking at cube you know every two or three hours okay to see how things are changing and I think the other thing I'm doing is uh, I've talked about this before but pe people talk about you know what what things look like a week ago and two weeks ago. So 
you know, I, I had people telling me, well, I, I've got 25 roles, but 20 of them are on hold. And it's like, no, you, you've got five roles. So that's been quite kind of destructive. Uh, <laughs> but people now know where they're at. And it, it's taken some people longer than others to realize that a job and a vacancy that you had on three weeks ago doesn't exist anymore. So yeah. you know, yeah. basically looking at the the new world and it's a bit like, you know, for me, April one, it's like starting a new business. So we, we had yeah. a, a good Q1, great Q2, a great March, but we're now a completely different company come April one. And we're basically back to where we were 10 years ago in terms of, you know, how many people are working on the business and the kind of vacancies we're dealing with. So we yeah. need to lean on that experience of growing something and dealing with, you know, less volume and higher quality, which is what we did back then. So I think keeping a handle on the money and the cash and the bank and the pipeline and the debt chasing and all that cool stuff yeah. is important. And then the next thing is the visibility via Cube or mm. the likes, you know, any business intelligence to basically say, look, this is where I'm at, at, you know, three o'clock yeah. on Wednesday <laughs> afternoon and, and this is the real number. It's not where I'd like to be or yeah, yeah. where I was two weeks ago. Yeah, that so makes it's sense. just kind of being comfortable with the present uh, yeah. allows you to be more positive about the future, I think. Cool. Yeah. Um, just, a, just a complete change of subject here, guys, but I wanted to make sure that we cover it. Um, being a parent, difficult in, <laughs> in itself, but a lot of people I've spoken to, um, being a parent at home, um, having kids running loose <laughs> whilst you're trying to work from home, What's that been like for you guys? Brilliant. You guys go, go first because they've got younger children. <laughs> how, have you, how have you found it? Have you done anything that has really helped? Because I'd like to think there's quite a few people uh, tuning in right now that, that do have kids. I mean, I've heard people taking turns to run school lessons in their kitchen, doing PE lessons in the garden, doing different shifts. Like, what, what have Sean Louise, what have you done anything that's really helped? Although I'm sure it's still challenging, but I'll let Louise start because I, I call her super mum to, <laughs> to do that at the best. Do you want the right? real? Do you want the real honest truth? Yeah, the real honest truth. Right, you need to buy Easter eggs in bulk. <laughs> Easter eggs in bulk. Yeah. <laughs> Plant them in the cupboard and then reward them every three hours with an Easter egg. <laughs> really? <laughs> it doesn't matter if they don't get dressed. That's fine. Okay. Um, I think just. I think just letting the kids, um, I think if you go back to like when you were younger, you used to play out on the street all the time. You was allowed to do all these cool things in the garden, like make dens, climb over the fence, get muddy, you know, do all this stuff. And I just think if you've got the space, let them just be kids and it'll, it'll make your life a bit easier. I don't think so much structure is that necessary. Okay. I just think if they're happier, then everyone's happier. Um, yeah. The schooling's not gonna gonna change that much if you, if you're not doing you know six hours a day. Okay. I, I wouldn't worry too much about about that. But my personal view. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah. I don't agree. stress. I, I mean, um, you know, I've got three kids, ranging from yeah. coming up to two to seven is my oldest. So wow. thankfully, I've, my my wife's been amazing in terms of support. But and actually. Um, in a weird kind of way, you know, getting time to have breakfast with them and doing doing more quality time, but still working yeah. similar hours because I'm not travelling to and from work and, yeah. and various other things like that. I've, you know, I've had to uh, take more of an interest in uh, my son Charlie plays football, so we we run on break times. I have a break in the morning, a break in the afternoon, which is nice. spent twenty minutes yeah. in the garden playing football. But I, I think, look, just on a kind of a putting work aside point of view you know we're, we're obviously going through the world's going through a very difficult time and i think trying not to be as stressed and not to yeah. be as worried and shielding the kids from that because you know the last thing I, I think they pick up on that that type of stress and worry yeah. um and, and last thing anyone needs at the moment is 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 more of that so that's been something we've been really conscious to do is is try and keep the kids happy as yeah. louise said just enjoying themselves and hopefully not aware of what's going on in the wider world so much. Yeah, fair enough. 
Yeah, and, and ours is a bit different in that uh, we, we've got 20 year old twins. <laughs> oh, and, wow. uh, so we, we've had Joseph come back from uh, Sheffield Uni, Aaron's come back from Leeds Uni, but we're, we're eating better than we ever have in that we, yeah. we uh, the kids are making us three meals a day. <laughs> And I can go out to my fridge and the menus up for the week. So I'm yeah, amazing. What I'm for my tea and amazing. It's brilliant. Amazing. Yeah. Um, so as we sort of come come towards the end here, um, just use it as a bit of a time to sort of reflect. Really, like what what do you over the sort of question from Alien Round, which was over the last few weeks. What what's been the biggest lesson that you guys have learned? Do you think? I think it. Look. It, just on a personal level, um, I think it's reinforced how important time is. You know, I think yeah. previously um, on a personal level, probably didn't feel like I had enough time in the day. And now, weirdly enough, you've got loads of time in the day per se yeah. um, because you're doing a lot of other things, but you're not able to use that time with the same quality that you would want to use it in other, in other things. So learning for me really both in my business and in my personal life is, is, you know, look, don't take time for granted and use it constructively. Yeah. Louise, John, biggest think, learning over the last couple of weeks? I think for me, um, it, it's brought me back down to reality a little bit. Um, yeah. grounded, grounded me a bit more than, than I was. Um, you know, just being like really thankful for like basic things in life, really. Um, yeah. Like we're doing quite a bit of charity work at the minute, trying to raise money for food banks, and we've been going over to to those places and just seeing, you know, the the state that people are are in at the moment that can't get food. It, it's just sort of made me really realise how it's fortunate we are anyway. Do you know, um, yeah. in, especially working in recruitment, you you're very fortunate that you, you're in a job where you can control control your earnings to an extent. So I think just just made me really thankful for being in that position. Yeah, John. Yeah, biggest for learning me, for you? Yeah, I think for me it's uh, I think controlling the controllables. So, yeah. uh, you know, not not getting too carried away if something happens that's really really good, or or not getting too down yeah. if anything happens that is horrific. So, just being in a position whereby my, my philosophy, you know, every evening myself and Sarah go out for a walk, and we our philosophy is right. We're one day closer to the yeah. other side of it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the world's going to be a different place. You know, we're going to be, uh, you know, in some respect, a different kind of family. Yeah. Uh, but just being appreciative of the fact that at the moment, you know, we're all healthy. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're all strong. And, uh, you know, we're very fortunate to be in a position where, you know, we're dealing with this because there's many people who would swap with us tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, being, you know, controlling what you can control. And don't sweat it if things aren't going right and being there for your people and, you know, having everybody kind of, you know, ringing you up in recent weeks. And I mean, one of the most remarkable things for me has been, you know, people ringing me up saying, how, how are you? You know, yeah. n- nobody's done that in 10 years. So. <laughs> <laughs> not, not even my family. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. Um, how, so on that note, as you tend on one day closer to, getting on the other side of this like how what are your guys thoughts on how the recruitment industry or just how are things going to look at the other side of this do you think how different are they going to be i i think the i think look the the work from home situation i think will mean that there's probably more flexibility i think you know, you know even my own personal point of view i, I, I was a bit old school on that front in, in yeah. always kind of wanting to be in the office but i think there is something to be said that you can be productive to a certain extent working from home. So I think you'll see more recruitment businesses kind of having a blended approach of people working from home and not. Um, I think, I think you know, hopefully from a customer point of view, I think it will continue to steer from, um, you know, what are kind of purely transactional relationships of just someone trying to sell that one candidate or trying to get that one job on to to building longer term relationships with people because you know they will have had things to talk to them about when they haven't had that job on or when they haven't had that one candidate so hopefully um, and certainly the way we're positioning our business is to try and have stronger relationships both with candidates and clients when when we come out the other side of this mm. nice yeah i think the work from home piece is going to be really interesting after all of this
Yeah. Um, Louise, John, how do you see things looking? I think video is going to be obviously the big one, isn't it? Yeah. The big, the big change. Um, from our point of view, engineering companies um, don't really use videos that much. Um, so we always have to go over and drive to the site, which is brilliant for us. But I think those quick online meetings are going to help. Say drive over and show them how to turn on the computer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, drive over and obviously have a look around the factory and things like that. But yeah, yeah, sometimes yeah. you just want that quick job spec, especially on contracts where yeah. you know you want to have that that face to face time. I think that's going to improve um, consultants' yeah. mindsets on that as well. And obviously the clients are going to have to get on board. It'll just become a bit more normal. Yeah. And um, so I think video and pushing each pushing people out of the comfort zone a little bit on that. Is, mm. has already happened so that that would be a really big positive mm. in all of this definitely john yeah. anything that you're thinking about i think for me where i see it changing is uh i think what you'll find is the good guys who looked after their clients candidates staff relationships i think they'll come out of this in three six nine months time in a really really strong position yeah i think yeah. the the bad guys won't come out of it i think they'll go bust yeah. Uh, yeah, which unfortunately does then create an opportunity for the good guys. So I think there'll be a bit of a reckoning and, you know, how you treat your suppliers and can candidates and clients yeah. now and, and, and how our suppliers treat us. Yeah, uh, it'll be remembered. Be, it'll be remembered and there'll be a reckoning. I, th I think I see, you know, a lot of people doing some great stuff and helping people where they can and you know i think uh, there's going to be an amazing opportunity for for companies who've done that and recognize that during these tough times yeah um final final question guys um so it was from um sandra patel i think it's a great question to close on i think fair to say a lot of people feel like they're in survival mode right now i think that Sean, when we spoke the last couple of days that's how you've answered the phone yeah i'm surviving <laughs> and, uh, like what What's, what's your number one sort of survival bit of advice for, for people listening right now? What, what's your, your number one survival bit of advice? <clears throat> I think, look, just, just look for opportunities and celebrate any small win. I think, you know, yeah. if, if, when I'm speaking to, to my teams and my consultants, you know, the conversation has not gone from, okay, well, I've not got a job or I've not got an interview, I've not made, made a placement to okay, well, I've progressed that relationship. Or I've got this bit of information from that client and still celebrating that, as, as John says, that's a one step closer to something that's going to yield something when this, when this upturn you know, inevitably comes. So celebrate the small wins, I would say. Nice. Louise? Say that, say that again, sorry. It's gone a bit off. It's gone off. No worries. What, what's your one piece of like, survival bit of advice for people? Survival, um, I think for me, it would be understanding yourself and learning about what you're like as a person right now. Um, right. I've been reading my disc profile recently, so if you've not done that, I'd probably advise you, you actually do it, and it, it sort of tells you how you behave in, in certain ways, in certain like conflicts and yeah. under stress and stuff like that, so I think when I reread it last week, it did actually help me go, oh, actually, I'm not an absolute psychopath. This is, <laughs> <actually>. <laughs> that's why I'm like that's why I'm doing this so I think it just helps you stay a bit grounded and stay calm so nice understand sure. you, understand yourself love that uh, yeah my, my thoughts are, I think don't lose your sense of humor I think it's very easy yeah. in this situation watching the news and seeing social media to kind of go down that negative path and there's enough of that out there but yeah I think keeping your sense of humor and keeping your keeping a positive mindset and you know my, my kids are obviously a little bit older but they, they were taking the mickey out of me the other day saying i, I remember like last week you owned a really successful recruitment company <laughs> <laughs> look, look at you now <laughs> and, but it was pretty funny so uh you know we yeah. Laugh. so yeah, yeah taking the mickey out of yourself and kind of uh remaining grounded and keeping a positive mount mindset i think is crucial yeah amazing mate well look sean john louise absolute pleasure thank you everyone for uh, tuning in really appreciate your time thanks for uh, sharing your thoughts perspectives really appreciate it so everyone okay. keep safe thanks wash your lot. hands and um i hope you're all well uh, thank, thank you, you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.
Cheers. Sending in eight seconds. I need to time that better next time. <laughs> <laughs>